So I have this bumper sticker on my car that triggers people. <laughs> it triggers people a lot. Let me show it to you guys. Um, I don't mean it to trigger people. That's not the goal at all. That's not my intention. But the logic is simple. It's meant to be a thought-provoking bumper sticker, something that makes somebody say, hmm, what does former embryo on board mean? I mean, that's what the bumper sticker says as you see it on screen before you. The logic of the, of the sticker is simple. It's that... You know, pro-choicers, people who tend to say abortion's okay, they, they, they really have two main things that they do, right? They want to move away from the idea that the thing inside the womb is like a living human being with, with value. And they want to move away from the idea that the, the behavior you're, you're enacting, the abortion itself, is the killing of that thing. And so they'll talk about things like a clump of cells. The baby's a clump of cells. Or it's a pregnancy. We're just terminating a pregnancy. Or a parasite. I've even yes, I've heard this that the babies are likened to parasites to justify killing them. But the bumper stickers just to say this: like you used to be an embryo, like you didn't come from an embryo, like you were an embryo, like I was an embryo. That's all I'm saying. Hey guys, I used to be an embryo. The logic is isn't even spelled out beyond that. But man, it triggers people. I have people that um, that chew me out, that honk, that yell at me. I mean, I live in California, <laughs> right? So so I, I have people who who get pretty upset with me about this stuff. I once had a lady follow me from where I parked my car into a school where I was speaking. She thought I worked for the school and she wanted to speak to the principal and, and chew him out. And she, in front of me, chewed out the principal for allowing me to work at the school. I was like, lady, I don't work at the school, but she like, it was like she had blinders on. She couldn't hear anybody. And so, um, yeah, that happens. Well, in this case, somebody left a note on my car. Okay, a, a passive aggressive note on my car. I'm going to read it to you in full right now. And then I want to an, I want to analyze it with you. Right? The the goal here is to understand the logic and the thinking that goes behind pro-choice stuff, not because right, here's the note. <laughs> not because I um I I want to make fun of it, not because I want to ridicule people, but because I think that there are people who are part of horrible moral atrocities in the past, right? Like, say, the Holocaust, say, say uh, chattel slavery, say, the, um, the, the massacres that we have. We've had so many horrible massacres in the past hundred years in the world. And people were part of it, and they thought it was fine at the time. It was in hindsight they looked back and saw it was bad. But the lesson we've missed from this, from all these atrocities, is that we're committing some now, specifically in relation to the most weak victims of, of all of society, babies. And we feel fine about it. And it's because of this logic right here. This logic right here is this stuff, the horrific thinking that causes things like genocides. And it's going on right now in, your, in our midst. It's the greatest moral issue in our lives today, apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ itself, is the issue of abortion. More so than anything about vaccines or plagues, viruses, anything about political issues other than this one. I mean, this is definitely a political issue. It has become political. But this issue matters. So we're going to analyze the logic here thoughtfully. Here is the note. This is what it says. Hello, former embryo. It is wonderful that you were born into a world whereby a parent, and they're going to offer three things here. One, wanted you and loved you. Two, could financially support you. Three, didn't bring you into an abusive nor neglected environment so that you would f you would face a, and then you flip the note over, life of suffering or even death. If these three things cannot be in place, then there is nothing. That, listen to this logic. This is, this is horrific. This is like Hitler on my windshield. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> If these things cannot be in place, there is nothing that is beautiful nor a blessing about this poor victim coming into this world. Please take a reality check needed by all anti-choice persons. And then there is the smiley face at the bottom of the note, the bottom right hand of the note. The smiley face, which to me is the most offensive part. <laughs> but we're going to dig through this and understand it thoughtfully and logically and rationally, just like every pro-choice person does not. I mean that genuinely. Pro-choice people, you are terribly irrational, highly emotional, and you are ignoring the most important central issues that you are taking a stance on. You're taking a stance on a moral issue, but you're not even thinking or willing to talk in most cases about the problem at hand. You're not even willing to use the right words. Um, we're, we're ending a pregnancy, right? Do you really not realize you're just pretending to not do the thing you're really doing? You're killing a human. 
let's dig into this. Here's the reasons why, and we're going to apply it to my life first. Okay, I'm going to tell you guys a couple things about my life that I don't normally tell. Um, by the way, if you don't know me, my name is Mike Winger. I do this stuff online. I help you learn how to think biblically about everything. I don't want nothing from you except to just stimulate your thoughts, hopefully stimulate your faith in Christ, give you better glasses for understanding the biblical worldview and being able to apply and understand scripture in your life. And this is one area where our culture is upside down, inside out, backwards. We're calling evil good and good evil and all that. And we're going to apply this to my life. Um, she assumed a lot of, I'm assuming it's a girl. I don't know. It could be a guy. I don't actually care if it was a girl or a guy who wrote the note. Let's just say it was a girl. Um, because I don't know, for some reason, the handwriting made me think it was a girl. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, we'll see. Um, but the, uh, the three things we're going to apply to my life. I normally don't tell a lot of stuff about my life, um, about my, my, my past growing up. And this is not because I'm embarrassed about things. It's because I want to protect some family members who, um, I don't want to trash them. (laughs) So, uh, so I'm going to share a few things. I'm going to try to be careful about how much I share and I'm not going to share all this stuff. There's a lot more, but, but I'll share a couple of things because I want to be able to apply it to this note. So let's look at the first thing. The first thing that she said was that I was born into a world whereby I was wanted, right? A parent wanted me and loved me. Okay, that's very important. And this is a reason to kill somebody if, 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 if this isn't in place. Now, the first thing we'll say is this, is that this means your value. This is where I want to pro choice her to think through their logic. This means that your value, if you affirm this note, your value is based upon how much your parents want and love you. And I want you to slow your roll just a second and think of how horrific this is. For this to be true, my value, the worthiness of my life, my worth to live is based upon a parent loving loving me and wanting me. How many people have become valueless now? How many people were not loved or wanted by a parent and we're looking at them now with this logic, this insane, horrific, genocidal logic and saying, your life's not worth it. It would, have been, it would have been nicer to kill you. It would have been a mercy, a kindness to you to kill you. <sighs> yeah. So a lot of people would become valueless. Now, it presumes the value of human life changes if a parent doesn't love you. Now, if you want to think biblically, if you want to be a Christian, which I do, <laughs> then you're going to have to understand that our value doesn't come from any parent at all. Parents don't provide value. Listen to this. Genesis 127, Scripture says, God created man in his own image in the image of God he created the male and female he created them this establishes human value as like the highest value of all all of created things that that are on the earth there's nothing else that compares to humans we have the highest value above plants above animals not that animals don't have value they they have value look here's my cat right there she is does she not have value oh the kitty (laughs) of course she does but she doesn't have value like me or like you. We're made in the image of God. That makes us a whole different kind of thing. Uh, Genesis also elaborates on this a little bit to help us understand our human value by, in Genesis 9, 6, this is, I'll have to explain this just a little bit for those who haven't heard it before. But God says that whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man his blood will be shed. And man here is meant to to mean mankind, male, female. For God made man in his own image. The idea here is that there's a like an accounting or a judicial requirement <clears throat> that that governmentally and I have a video on this why I would am pro death penalty but I'm not I'm not pro choice uh, right I think that death penalty for murderers yes actual murderers guilty truly guilty murderers that that's appropriate and right whereas death penalty for children because a parent doesn't care about them is disgusting and horrible but yes the idea here is that that in Genesis nine six you're different than animals. You are in God's image. This means that your value is innate. If you're human, you're in God's image. This value goes into every human being from the moment they are a human being, which would be the moment of conception. There's this, if, if you're pro-choice and you think conception doesn't begin life and doesn't begin human life, you are way behind the science. You're, you're, you're a biological flat earther at this point. No offense, flat earthers. But this is this is to just draw a parallel here. You are you are very behind the curve, so to speak, on the topic of biology. Um, so, my own story. Let me p- apply this to me a little bit. Um, it's not as shiny as this n- this person might have assumed, which is ironic that they assume this. They just see my car and see a bumper sticker and they assume they know my life. 
<laughs> but, but there you go. Um, my own story is not quite so bright and shiny. Um, I could tell you lots and lots of stories, but I'm going to give you the bottom line conclusion that I had when I was when I first came to Christ when I was about 12 years old. And if you let me just say this, I had come to a realization at a certain point that my and this was my belief at the time. I, I have a good relationship with my dad now. We're 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 friends. I love my dad, and he and he loves me. But at the time, I didn't believe my dad left me. Like, I legitimately believed he did not care about me. I didn't think he hated me. I just thought he didn't care. I had a lot of good reasons for thinking that. And that would imply that it was therefore maybe a mercy thing to just kill me. My stepdad, who was in my life, my, my parents had got divorced and I was too young to remember. And um, my stepdad actually disliked me. Uh, everybody knew it. Everybody in the family knew it. He just kind of hated me. Um, and he made, like, I think he enjoyed when I cried. That's true. I'm, I'm not. I'm not looking for sob stories here. I'm not looking to make you guys feel bad for me. Uh, a lot, like God has so redeemed all the hardship I went through as a child that I don't look back at it in that way. I look back at it and I'm like, wow, look at what you did through this, God. Okay, so there isn't that kind of thing. But for an illustration, I'll just say this without telling you guys a lot of stories. There was a long season of life where, when he was around, because it was a rocky marriage and he was in and out of the house all the time, when my stepdad was around, me and my sister would get home from school. And we would go to our rooms and we would sit there for hours until my mom got home because we knew that if we if we just showed our faces in the living room where he was at all times creating a cloud of smoke <laughs> with his chain smoking where, where he was at all times that that it was going to be ugly for us okay that it was going to be unpleasant um that he was going to take out his irritations in, in in life towards us and towards me in particular and so we would just stay in our rooms when my mom got home we could come out and he would then just ignore us and that was fine because he didn't want to have a fight with her about it. Um, my mother had a, other things going on I don't want to get into. But but let me just say, things were unpleasant for me. Um, when I was invi invited to church at the age of 12, it was it was the reason I went was not because I was interested in church. It was a buddy who asked me in junior high, hey, you want to come to youth group? I had no idea what that was. Um, and it was near my house. I was, it was close enough to walk. It was just literally a way to get out of the house. And that's why I started going to church where I met the Lord. What I learned from God was that I had value and I had purpose and I had meaning apart from all the stuff going on in my life. I did not have much hope in life. I didn't have a lot of perspective or, or, or view of self-value. I, I would have viewed myself kind of the way that the woman who wrote the note would have viewed me. Oh, what a worthless life. What a pointless existence. But what I learned from God, and this was... Without anybody teaching it to me, it's just what happened in my life when my life was transformed by Christ. Psalm 2710. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. This is what I experienced. Okay? God took care of me. God became my father. My God. Present with me. Showing me that I was loved, that I was cared for, that God so loved me. Like knowing God's love put ground under my feet. You see, what I'm saying here is the Christian worldview is what rescues us from this sort of horrific genocidal logic. We realize that all humans have innate value because they are made in God's image and that God, you look at the gospel of Christ, that God loves them even if, even though they've sinned, even though they've fallen short, that they can be redeemed, they can be brought into relationship with God through Christ. This, you are valuable and there's a God who truly loves you even though you're, you're evil. And you need grace and forgiveness, but honest people know this about themselves. <laughs> and so, um, yes, God loves the wicked. He also then loves babies in the womb and they're valuable. God's love put ground under my feet in my life, uh, freed me from thinking that I didn't matter because as far as I could tell, I didn't matter to the, especially the two men that were in my life. So number one, <clears throat> I didn't quite pass that test. Um, not quite like she thinks. <laughs> number two, let's look at <clears throat> number two, second reason why I should not, why I maybe should have been aborted, that my parents could financially support me. <laughs> That's funny. Um, you know, those who lived poor, they know a couple things. They know this. <laughs> poverty, um, unless it's life-threatening poverty, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, it matters. It matters. But especially to a child who grows up in a lot of poverty, that it doesn't ruin you. Like you, it's just how it is. Okay, like I can't tell you how many times my mom, we, we were poor for American standards at least. Okay, not 
for complete and destitute poverty. But I can't tell you how many times my mom came to us and said, hey, kids, for the next two weeks, we have $20 for food. So that we were, we were, you know, short on things. I remember my stepdad's car getting repossessed. Uh, they said that it was stolen. I found out many years later that it was just repossessed and they were just lying because he was embarrassed. But he had this like Z28 he never should have got. <laughs> and the car got stolen, uh, or so we thought, in the middle of the night. I remember him getting up and racing and then freaking out and yelling at the guy who took it. But it was actually just repossessed because, you know, we uh, money was not handled well. So some of you may not know, this is like a pastime to me, something called macaroni and tomato soup. So this is where, um, at least for our family, you just, you have no money, okay? So you just take a bag of macaroni noodles, right? You, you boil them in water, you dump tomato soup, a, a few cans, not, not, not like the 50-50 ratio of tomato soup to water you usually have, but you just dump a couple cans in there, it's kind of bland. And that's dinner. <laughs> that's dinner. And then I would just put ketchup in there to try to like add some flavor. I didn't care as a kid. I was just like, whatever. This is this tastes fine to me as long as there's food for me to eat because I was just constantly hungry. Um, <clears throat> but there were times where it was pretty slim. And I do remember for a season when we discovered Top Ramen, um, eating Top Ramen so often that I got sick of it to this day. To this day. So many years later, I will not eat Top Ramen. I mean, if I have to, I'd eat it, but not by choice. I'm, I've had too much. At the time, it was like 17 cents a meal for Top Ramen. I mean, so we're just eating it all the time, constantly, right? So I remember a story. Here's a little story for you guys. I'm trying to share the nicer stories for you because <laughs> I don't really want to... Um, I'm not trying to put people on blast for things that happened so long ago and their lives have changed and my life has changed and I want to acknowledge that and give God praise for that. But I remember um, we were poor enough that uh, I did have a bike, but um, my bike helmet, uh, I couldn't afford to replace. We had a we had a pet dog and the dog had chewed up my bike helmet and damaged it. It was just a styrofoam cheap bi bike helmet, just styrofoam with plastic on top of it. And the dog had chewed it all up. So I, I, I was like, well, I guess I can't wear it anymore. It's not going to protect me. So I was riding my bike as a kid. I, I don't know how old I was, like 10, uh, riding around the residential area like not even main street, just residential area. And this lady pulled me over in like, she wasn't a cop. She was like, I don't know what, what she was. Some like civil servant pulled me over and said, Hey, stop right there. You, you broke two laws just now. And I was like, what? I'm 10 years old. You know? And so she tells me I broke two laws that I had crossed the street, not at a crosswalk. It's residential. <laughs> and and I was not wearing a helmet. And there's a bike law. If you're under 18, you have to wear a helmet where I lived. So she writes me a ticket. And she's like, well, why aren't you wearing a helmet? And I was like, well, my dog ate it. I don't think she believed me. I was like, my dog ate it. You know, My dog chewed it all up. It's damaged. She goes, well, you need to buy a new one. And I was like, how much is this ticket going to be? She goes, $60. And I said, $60? We can't even afford to buy me a new helmet. Right? So I, so it took forever to pay that thing off. But... um. But then, from then on out, I would ride around with this janky, broken, chewed up bike helmet on my bicycle. Literally just like chunks taken out of it, all the styrofoam exposed, the straps. I'm just like, if I fall, this is no protection. But I was like, I can't get another ticket. Well, that that's how it was. Um, now, that's not abject poverty. We were, we were poor, okay? We were definitely poor. Um, there were things going on there and it was a lot of mismanagement of money and stuff like that was going on there too. Um, but should I have been aborted? Right, There's two major issues in my life that, that are on her list of three. Should, should I have been aborted? Do you guys think it was okay to kill me? Because I was that embryo in the womb. I was that baby in the womb. That was me. I didn't come from a baby. It's not like when, when birth happens, all of a sudden there's a person there. We just it, We're just talking about moving from this part of the womb to that part of the womb. Should I have been aborted? But, but it gets way worse than that. What about people who are in abject poverty? The Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo represents the poorest country in the world. Did you know that? The poorest country in the world. Let's apply her logic. This insane, morally insane woman who represents a very large portion of our society today to the Democratic Republic of Congo. 33 of the 40 poorest countries in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. Should they all have abortions? Is that merciful? In 2018, it was estimated that in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that the Congolese population 
has 73% of them who live on less than $1.90 a day. 73%. 43% of Congolese children are currently malnourished, according to worldbank.org. Things are getting worse right now because of COVID in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, we have two options with these, these, these beautiful children made in God's image. We can try to kill them by supporting Planned Parenthood, or maybe we can help them by supporting Samaritan's Purse. I have a link down below. I'm not making anything off this, but there's a link down below to Samaritan's Purse if you want to support their efforts to help the Democratic Republic of Congo to teach, to, to give them uh, supplies, infrastructure, food, education, care, and also the gospel of Jesus Christ, then, you know, there's something you can do if you'd like to help them. But no, actually, if, if you believe what, what the moral insanity of our culture, then you think that the merciful thing to do is to kill the kids earlier on, right? Kill them when they're even younger, right? If, if a baby dies at one year old, that's tragedy. But, it, but if the baby dies when, when, when it's seven months of, a lo of life inside the womb, well, that's okay. That's, that's not tragedy. That's merciful. That's the ins insane logic. So we're confronted with the problem of poverty, neglect, or lack of care, and we have two solutions. Kill them or take care of them, right? If you're born into a family where a parent doesn't love you, the solution is for the parent to love you. If you're born into a, into a community which is in poverty, the solution is to try to help that community come out of poverty. If you're born into a, a situation that is rough, the solution is not to kill the kid. The third reason given in the note, let's see. The third reason, here we go, first page. She says that she's grateful that I was loved and wanted. Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how much that applies to me. Um, number two, that my parents could financially support me. That's not true. Number three, <clears throat> they didn't bring me into an abusive or neglected environment that you would face a life of suffering or even death. Well, I um, was definitely... Uh, in a very unhappy environment. I was not happy as a kid. I was uh, a sad, lonely, and somewhat depressed kid. That's, I mean, that's, that was my life before Christ. It was, it was my life was transformed when I came to Christ. I think it was the, how messed up things were for me personally, or at least, I, you know, that, that I, I felt that things were that wrong and that off. That was one of the reasons why I clung to God so much. And that at the age of 12, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, like as I'm, I'm following Jesus and I'm taking things so seriously. And I would see kids that were like raised in the church taking it so for granted that the gospel of Christ, the truth about God. And to me, I, I had felt life without it before I got that. And so I, I, would, I just thought it was weird that they would take it so for granted. I realized that's just part of our human condition. We're really good at taking things for granted. But yeah, that, that's simply not true, okay? Simply not true in my life. Um, but this is like, literally, this is suicide logic. This is the logic of, you know what? If life's bad, you should just kill the person, right? In this case, the you're going to kill the baby, but it's, the logic applies to yourself here is the suicide logic, which would cause a lot of people to give up on life far too soon. <laughs> far too soon, especially in Christ when there's eternal hope, eternal happiness, eternal joy. You have to hang in there. My situation's so bad, I give up. It, in this case, it's literally a guess. This baby, I'm going to just predict the future about this baby and, and say, I think their life will be bad in the future. And because of what I project and think will happen, I'm going to kill the baby as a kindness. This is genocidal, horrific, murderous logic with a smiley face. Notice what she says would be so tragic is that if I was brought into a situation of abuse, a life of suffering, or even death. And I could just feel her like, oh, even death. The reason why this shocks me is because she literally holds up the death of this child as a tragedy, and her solution to the tragedy is to kill the child earlier on. Right? Like, what if the child's going to die at seven? Should we kill the child at three? Is that better? What if, if the child's going to die at three? Should we kill the child at one? If the child will die at one or 10 or 30 or just live really unhappily, should we just kill the baby before they cross the barrier of the mother's womb so that we, you know, they're, they're, we don't see them yet. They don't, they don't count yet. This is why she says, if these three, three things cannot be in place, this is where the pro-choice logic goes 
um, into, into self-deceit, self-deception. She says, then there's nothing beautiful nor a blessing about this poor victim coming into this world. She thinks the victim's not in the world yet. The author of the letter, the, the note, the person, guy or girl, whoever it is, they think like many people do today who support abortion, that babies in the womb are literally not existing yet. They're not in the world yet. Well, they're not across the barrier of the womb into open air, but they're certainly in existence, right? So this poor victim's in the world, but we need, we need, this is the reality check we need. We've got to realize that babies in the womb are alive. So listen, this is produced by live action. I'm going to share a video with you. It's a few minutes long. It's super good. Like amazing um, graphic and very accurate depiction of what life in the womb actually looks like. Because back in the day, they thought that the, this wasn't going on. They didn't realize how advanced, how intricate, um, when human life began. They didn't know these things many years ago. And many pro-choice people want to keep themselves in the dark about what's going on inside the womb. But listen to this. This is baby Olivia. Every stage of development in the human womb described in great detail, beautifully. I'm going to show you this and I'm going to contrast it with what abortion really is. This is Olivia. Though she has yet to greet the outside world, she has already completed an amazing journey. This is the moment that life begins. A new human being has come into existence. At fertilization, her gender, ethnicity, hair color, eye color, and countless traits are already determined. She begins to implant in the uterus about one week after fertilization. Her cells organize into what we call an embryo. At three weeks in one day, just 22 days after fertilization, Olivia's heartbeat can be detected. The buds of her arms and legs appear by four weeks. She begins to move between five and six weeks with both spontaneous and reflexive movements. At six weeks from fertilization, her brain activity can be recorded and bone formation begins. She can bring her hands together at seven and a half weeks and separate fingers and toes emerge. She can also begin to hiccup. At the beginning of the ninth week, Olivia will have grown from a single cell into nearly one billion cells, and she is now called a fetus. She will suck her thumb and swallow, grasp an object, touch her face, sigh and stretch. At 11 weeks, she is playing in the womb, moving her body and exploring her environment. Her taste bud cells have matured by week 12, but are still scattered throughout her mouth. Her mother will first sense Olivia's movements between 14 and 18 weeks, an event called quickening. Beginning at 18 weeks, ultrasounds show speaking movements in her voice box. Around 20 weeks, with a lot of help, babies have survived outside the womb. At 27 weeks, her eyes are responding to light she can recognize her parents' voices and will even recognize lullabies and stories. Olivia has gone on an amazing journey during these last nine months. She will soon signal to her mother that it is time for delivery and greet the outside world. Okay, the, you guys can check that out. Uh, Liveaction.org, they have the these videos. They've given me permission to do what I'm doing right now with them and... Here's the thing, every single stage of life that you just saw displayed in front of you beautifully, every stage is what the Democrats, okay, I'm not a rep Republican exactly, right? But my point is this moral issue and the wrong side of it is being promoted by particular political interests in our culture, right? It, it's like they're, um, 
their agenda. This is like a major, major agenda, which is why I, I think I have to describe myself politically as not Democrat. <laughs> like, I don't know what else to say. So the, um, the issue of abortion is being promoted and championed, shout your abortion. But they, they think every stage you just saw in that video is a stage at which you can kill and end that baby's life. But they don't talk about it honestly. They say end a pregnancy, terminate a pregnancy right? Have an abortion. Like this is euphemistic terms that don't talk about the details, right? When we, when we send somebody to the electric chair, like that's a death penalty. Uh, we call it a death penalty. We, we actually use the word death. We want to be aware of how vivid and how deep and how real this thing is. Nobody says finish his prison sentence end incarceration. We don't call it ending incarceration because that would be like to insult the, the, the thing that's happening to desensitize ourselves to what's actually happening. At every stage you saw, an abortion is considered okay. And here are the three different kinds of abortions that are very common amongst those different stages. First trimester, second and third trimester abortions described by an abortion doctor. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. At the abortion clinic or doctor's office, the woman takes pills which contain mifepristone, also called RU46. RU46 blocks the action of a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is naturally produced in the mother's body to stabilize the lining of the uterus. When RU46 blocks progesterone, the lining of the mother's uterus breaks down, cutting off blood and nourishment to the baby, who then dies inside the mother's womb. Step two. 24 to 48 hours after taking RU46, the woman takes misoprostol, also called Cytotec, that is administered either orally or vaginally. RU46 and misoprostol together cause severe cramping, contractions, and often heavy bleeding to force the dead baby out of the woman's uterus. The process can be very intense and painful, and the bleeding and contractions can last from a few hours to several days. While she could lose her baby any time and anywhere during this process, the woman will often sit on a toilet as she prepares to expel the child, which she will then flush. She may even see her dead baby within the pregnancy sac. At nine weeks, for example, the baby will be almost an inch long, and if she looks carefully, she might be able to count the fingers and toes. Dini is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. With babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. 
Today I'm going to describe a third trimester induced abortion, which is performed at 25 weeks to term. At this point, the baby is almost fully developed and viable, meaning he or she could survive outside the womb if the mother were to go into labor prematurely. Because the baby is so large and developed, this procedure takes three or four days to complete. On day one, the abortionist uses a large needle to inject a drug called digoxin. Digoxin is generally used to treat heart problems, but a high enough dosage of digoxin will cause fatal cardiac arrest. The abortionist inserts the needle with the digoxin through the women's abdomen or through her vagina and into the baby, targeting either the head, torso, or heart. The baby will feel it. Babies at this stage feel pain. When the needle pierces the baby's body and the digoxin takes effect, the life of the baby will end. The abortionist then inserts multiple sticks of seaweed called laminaria into the woman's cervix. They will slowly open up the cervix for delivery of a stillborn baby. While the woman waits for the laminaria to dilate her cervix, she carries her dead baby inside of her for two to three days. On day two, the abortionist replaces the laminaria and may perform a second ultrasound to ensure the baby is dead. If the child is still alive, he administers another lethal dose of digoxin. The woman then goes back to where she is staying while her cervix continues to dilate. If she goes into labor and is unable to make it to the clinic in time, she will give birth at home or in a hotel. In this case, she may be advised to deliver her baby into a bathroom toilet. The abortionist then comes to remove the baby and clean up. If she can make it to the clinic, she will do so during her severest contractions and deliver her dead son or daughter. If the baby does not come out whole, then the procedure becomes a DNE, a dilation and evacuation, and the abortionist uses clamps and forceps to dismember the baby piece by piece. Once the placenta and all the body parts have been removed, the abortion is complete. I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a preborn child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. Wow. The insanity of pro choice logic, at least in the case of this note, obviously there's individuals who, <clears throat> there are even some who go so far as to fully admit, yes, it's killing, yes, it's killing a person, I just think it's okay. okay? <laughs> They're willing to admit it. I, I, I think they stand as good examples of how horrific pro-choice thinking actually is, but more often we see this. In her note, she literally pretends that the baby, letting the baby live would be victimizing the baby Whereas killing the baby is just keeping it from coming into the world. But as you see from the development, from the, from the moment sperm hits egg, now there's a new human life with its own DNA, its own genetics, right? Now it's, now it's a boy or a girl, right? Genetically, there's actually real things going on there that are like, this is, this is a human. This is a living human being. And for people are like, well, they're humans, but they're not persons. Like, this is the same logic that justified slavery, justifies the murder of, of genocide of, of whole people groups. Let's talk about this because this is the reality check. The, rea the real reality check that everybody needs to get, I think, is just to recognize that, like Horton said a long time ago, a person's a person no matter how small. We're, we're just saying they're tiny or they don't have, that, they don't have certain capabilities yet. Okay, so this, these are the differences between you and, and an infant in the womb, a, a fetus, an embryo. These are the differences between you and an embryo. Size, level of development, environment, and dependency. These are the four things you can say are like, actually different. They're smaller. Okay, does smaller mean less valuable? No, that's insane, right? Because then we're like, okay, the bigger people are the more valuable, valuable people in society. Like if you're small enough, we can kill you. That's, that's clearly moral insanity. Number two, level of development. Okay, so if someone's less developed, does that mean that I can kill them? Well, no. I mean, we, we actually tend to look at it the other way around. We tend to usually think that those who are less developed are also less defendable. They're, they're unable to defend themselves. 
So it's our job to defend them. We defend the defenseless. It's the older brothers and sisters that, that guard and protect the younger ones. It's the parents that take care of the kids. It's the more strong and powerful and fully developed people in society that protect the weak. That is moral goodness. But to suggest that if you're underdeveloped to a certain point, now I can kill you. I mean, imagine this. Like, I know that some of you guys see these, these a picture of like a, an embryo and you're like, boy, they look weird. Like, even though I'm, pro, I'm pro-life, they, they just look weird. I totally grant you that. Strange to your eyes. But that is how humans always look at that age. Yes, they're small. Yes, their level of development is, is small. But imagine for a second if in your entire life you never saw children. You'd only seen teenagers and up. Like, you'd seen 18, old, 18 years and older. These are the only people you'd ever seen in your life. And then one day, somebody brings to you a newborn baby. Seven days old, one day old newborn baby. And they show it to you and they go, guess what? This is what humans look like really early on. You'd look at that baby and you'd think, oh, that weird, bald, little, strange, chubby, like, raisin looking thing what is this you would look at that baby and you would naturally think this is strange this is odd well because we can't physically see the development of the baby in the womb we sometimes respond strangely to the visual of an embryo and think well it looks strange it doesn't look human but literally every human looks that way at that age you just don't usually get to see them so this would be a very dangerous and scary approach oh that human looks strange to me so therefore they're less valuable it's okay to kill them um, yeah. Environment is the third re- third difference between uh, adults and babies or adults and babies in the womb. Environment. Okay, but just being in the womb doesn't mean you, it's okay to kill. Right? This is why pro, uh, pro, pro-lifers pro get, get excited and celebrate when rulings come down that are more strict against those who violate the baby in the womb. Uh, for an example, if a person kills a mom who's pregnant and the baby dies too, do they get tried for murder or double murder, right? Is it is it two murders or one? How many happen there? And the pro-choicer here is, is, at a, is in a conflict, right? So they say, gosh, I, 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 I have that natural moral sense that the, the killing of the baby was a second murder. But if I say it was, then I'm hurting my own pro-choice position because I'm telling the mom that she can kill the baby, but somebody else can't. So some would say, let's try them. Let's try it as a single murder. We, we, we won't even give the baby the quality of life, even though it was killed. Um, others would say, no, no, it's okay because he killed the They make it all about the mom, right? He killed the, the baby, but if the mom kills the baby, that's okay. And that is like in our society, imagine if we just said that mothers could kill their children as long as it's the mom that does it. So if a two-year-old dies and the doctor's like, I suspect that the mother did this, it wouldn't matter. Because it was the mom. But if somebody else did it, then it, then, it, then it matters. Like this is this is moral insanity. So finally, there's dependency, right? So the size, level of development, environment, and dependency. Dependency is the final difference between you and an infant in the womb, you and an embryo. They're incredibly dependent. But so are a one-day-old baby, a six-month-old baby, a two-year-old, a seven-year-old, an 11-year-old, and oftentimes today, 27-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is. They're very dependent. But it doesn't mean it's okay to kill them. This means we must provide for them, take care of them, give them extra uh, grace and extra you know, care. We, 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 we see dependency as a reason to protect, not a reason to kill. This is the moral insanity of our culture. These abortions would literally, according to at least this note, this logic, would just be in case things are bad. And they're not justifiable, but... But what about all the, all the all the babies that grow through hard times into wonderful lives? I mean, I, I don't know if if my mom had gone to somebody and some pro choice person, maybe you out there, my mom had gone to you for counsel and said, you know, I've I've got I've got a daughter already. I'm pregnant with a with a son now, and and my marriage is falling apart. Things are really bad. I'm not really in good shape right now, and um, I'm, g- I'm going to get divorced. I'm not going to have the finances to take care of them. Life's really hard. What do you think I should do? How many of you out there would have told my mom to kill me? You're horrible. You need to repent. Only God can forgive you, but He can forgive you, and He will forgive you. But yeah, you're you're absolutely you're disgusting. And the sad thing is, I'm I'm disgusting too. Like we've all sinned and fallen short. The human, the thing abortion shows us is that humans in general are really messed up. Like we desperately need the grace of God. We're not just all sinners in the sense that like, hey, everybody makes mistakes, but we're all sinners in the sense that like, everyone's like capable of horrific, terrible, evil things. Often we're only held back by 
the con- the negative consequences we don't want to get. <clears throat> One of the most disturbing things um, when you look at history, not just about abortion, let's move off that topic just for a second to make an illustration, to make a point. Atrocities throughout history. You've heard me guys so far through this live stream, I've been saying um, abortion is like, it's like the Holocaust. Abortion is like genocides. Abortion is like the, the horrific, it's like uh, Mao. Abortion is like Stalin. Abortion is like Hitler. <clears throat> I've been saying that and some of you are probably really bothered by me saying that, but I I think it's actually factually true. I think that the parallels are close enough that we should say it's about the same thing. Let me give you some examples of this. And this is going to come from Clay Jones' book. <clears throat> Pardon me. Clay Jones' book, which is a really great book on the topic of, of the problem of evil. Uh, Why Does God Allow Evil? I recommend you guys check it out if you are interested in that topic and understanding and thinking about it carefully. But in his book, he has an awful lot to say about this topic. He, he talks about how... One of the most disturbing things about genocides and atrocities in history, which we tend to think more clearly about the past than we do the present, one of the most disturbing things about them is that they're conducted by normal people. We imagine them being conducted by people who are evil. And even in most media, (coughs) pardon me, I'm sorry about that. Most media will portray like the, the, the Nazis as like these sort of like mean hearted individuals. But when you actually do the research on what people who committed genocide were like, they were like your nice neighbor, right? They looked like Mr. Rogers, except when they were committing genocide. That's the freakiest thing about it, but it tells us something about human nature. So atrocities were conducted by normal people who think they're just superior or they're justified. Either I'm better than them so that I I can do this to them or um, I'm just justified. There's some good reason I have for doing this. Hitler's atrocities, by the way, were not committed by Hitler. We blame Hitler for the deaths of millions, but it took countless individuals to partner along with him, countless participants, and they were just your your local librarian. They were just your your local school teacher. They were your neighbor. They were you. They were me. Me. In communist China, 26 to 30 million counter-revolutionaries were killed by Mao Zedong. Um, He boasted in a 1958 speech, I'm going to quote to you now. He says, we've buried alive 46,000 scholars. This is under Mao. They buried alive 46,000 scholars. Now, this isn't a a euphemism. They literally buried them alive. This was a preferred method of of execution under Mao. So he had 46,000 scholars they buried alive because the communist, the government wants total control. So they had to eradicate those who were leading thought away from the control of the government. Notice the we, because Mao never buried anybody alive. No, he had tons of people doing it. People who loved their kids, people who had pets they took really good care of, people who were generally helpful members of society. In Japan, in Japan, within a period of a few weeks, I'm quoting Clay Jones now, he says on page 54 of his book, within a period of a few weeks beginning in December 1937, the Japanese army raped, tortured, and murdered more than 300,000 Chinese in the city of Nanking. This is in one city in a period of just a few weeks. This is this is the the conflicts between Japan and China. Us in the West don't know that much about them, but this is this was a horrific, horrific thing. They raped, tortured, and murdered over three hundred thousand. Iris Chang in her book The Rape of Nanking, she writes this The rape of Nanking should be remembered not only for the number of people slaughtered, but for the cruel manner in which many met their deaths. And yes, I think this is just like abortion. It's it's identical. She says, Chinese men were used for bayonet practice and in decapitation contests. An estimated 20,000 to 80,000 Chinese women were raped. Many soldiers went beyond rape to disembowel women. You you might need to click off the video right now, and that's totally okay. It's going to get worse right now. That was your warning. I'm sorry for breaking your heart. We have to be aware of these things because they're really happening in our lives right now. That's what abortion is. And uh, we can make a difference if we can take a long look at it enough to get motivated. Many soldiers went beyond rape to disembowel women, slice off their breasts, nail them alive to walls. Fathers were forced to rape and rape their daughters and sons their mothers. As other family members watched, not only did live burials, castration, the carving of organs... And the roasting of people become routine, but more diabolical tortures were practiced. Yeah, there's worse stuff that we won't get into. The thing is this. 
these practices were done not by psychopaths or random really weird evil people. They were done by normal moms and dads. They were done by just random people, just people like you. Like li really people, This we got to soak this in. This is, we did this. This is humanity. These are humans. Humans do these horrible things. We're doing it right now with abortion, right now, every day. It, I think it's the uh, last time I looked a few years ago, it was 50 million abortions appearing uh, across the world every year, approximately. 50 million. This is just how humans are. I mean, what's the Taliban doing right now? Do you think they're all just like evil? They all, they all have a bad laugh, an evil laugh? Like the Taliban will murder somebody today and go home tonight and hug their children and read them a bedtime story. Because this is how humans are. This is humans are, are met, we're, we're sick with sin and we need salvation through Jesus Christ. We're all like this. We need to turn our hearts to Christ to be forgiven. This is the biggest and greatest need of mankind is to be reconciled to our creator because we are a fallen people. Um, a lot of people do, they, they will picture psychos and evil TV villains as the people doing these horrible things throughout history and ongoing today. But this is what Clay Jones says about how normal people commit genocide. Let me quote him again from page 60. He says, it has been fascinating to me that absolutely every genocide researcher I have ever read, and I've read a lot of them, and absolutely every genocide victim I've ever read to a person concludes that genocide is what, is what the average person does. It's what the average person does. The normal people. Abortion is supported. The crushing of a child's head, the sucking a part of their body and their removal from, from the womb, a pill to cut off the supply of life from the mother to the child and then force a dangerous and unpleasant uh, birthing procedure of a dead, now dead baby who is kept from taking the nutrition, like the plan B pill that often, not in every case, but in, you can't tell when, but in, in many cases, many, many cases is going to be just killing a newly, uh, newly existing human being. The most common abortion procedures today, like they're the things that I just showed in front of you a few minutes back. America does this to thousands, hundreds of thousands every year, every year. Just, just in the U.S. Oh, we're we're over. We're on the right side of history now. We we know what we're really fighting for, right? We're really fighting for gender e equality. We're really fighting for, um, you know, uh, gay rights. And we're really fighting for, um, you know, the oppressed, the oppressed, the oppressed. And and all these cries are going out. But these aren't really the values that are represented in our culture when you look at it in reality. These are talking points and and worldview changing issues and all that other stuff that's going on, but. But the real moral victims of our culture, oh, no, no, we're going to shout our abortions. We won't call them killing a baby. Usually, most people won't. We'll call it ending a pregnancy. We'll call it mercy. We're not bringing them into this world. We'll, we'll, we'll have this moral insanity. This person, and the worst part of the note to me, like I said before, was the smile at the end. The little smiley face, the smugness of, of genocidal thinking. This is why people need Jesus. I'm not better than this woman. I, I was this woman until it was... It was it was the gospel of Christ. It was the people being made in the image of God. It was thou shall not kill that got me to become pro-life, right? It was the moral clarity of God's word that was like, change me on this. I would be the same. I'd be like <clears throat> these, these um, oppressive people, a man trying to tell a woman what she can do with her body. Or like, yeah, let's just pretend this is about the woman's body. Let's just act like this is a male-female issue and not about the life of the baby in the womb. Let's just live in la-la land as we continue the long human pastime of committing murder and doing horrible things and feeling good about it. This is why we need Jesus. What the note showed me about pro-choice thinking is something I already knew. It's been kind of weathered, this note. I kept it for a little while so I could share it with you guys. Um, there's nothing new about this stuff. It is our desperate human need. This is why I have a channel thinking biblically about everything. Is our desperate human need is to learn how to how to say this is evil, that is good, how to rightly discern between good and evil, 
how to do this through the through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives, through the clarity and the direction we get through the Word of God, and then to be, of course, forgiven for our own failings. My my, I deserve to stand in judgment before God, just as you do too. Whether it's the things I've done in my heart, in my head, or in my in my life, I'm not just the poor victim of 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 a tough childhood. I I from the beginning I have been messed up, and it is the grace of Christ that has made the difference. I, I hope that this points you to Christ in some way. That's the note. And that's my video. Stand up. Don't be afraid. Hey, if, if you're looking, some of you guys are looking for that bumper sticker. Um, I don't think it's available anywhere. I went to WND.com, which is, I think, where it came from. Somebody gave it to me. And um, I don't think it's available anywhere. But we have a link to a, a make your own bumper sticker thing we found on Amazon. Don't know if it's any good. I'm not making any money off of it. We're just trying to, I just know people would be asking for it. So I put that in the video description down below. You guys can check that out. And I will be with you guys on Friday for our Q&A, learning to think biblically about everything. This is a hard topic. I'm trying to keep my, my heart not, not as heavy um, while I'm talking to you about it. Um, but, but I think that it's just shocking to me that, that this issue, even pro-life people, we're so in the tendency to just set this issue to the side. Oh, you know, it's not going to change. It's not going to change. Can I just say something about that? It doesn't matter if it changes. The question is, are you going to be part of the fight or not? Are you going to be on the right, the true right side of history, which is going to be the side that agrees with God? And will you stand up and will you stand against the crowd? I mean, Jeremiah is an example of a, of a prophet who preached and preached and preached and pretty much hardly anyone listened to him, certainly not the kings that he was trying to influence. But we look at him with admiration, even especially because nobody listened, especially because they pushed back and even persecuted him for what he said. This is the perspective we have to have in our lives now is that we, we speak truth about the gospel of Christ, about the topic of abortion, regardless of how people respond, because you don't know what effect you might have. You don't know that one person may be saved. And... Um, and if nothing else, you would have stood and testified the truth to a, to a culture in rebellion against God, thinking that it's wonderful, that it's beautiful, that it's something to celebrate when you kill your own baby. God help us.